Hey everybody, this is Wintermute uh, coming to you from the Think Tank and uh, I'm going to go over the Commonwealth Doctrines. Now, um, now obviously, like most things with, uh, with Great Britain, Anzac, and the Far East Command, it's all clumped together. It's all the Commonwealth. So all of the, I'm not going to make individual doctrines for FEC or uh, Anzac. Uh, I, I, certainly, I'm, I certainly could, um, you know, and obviously there is uh, some specialties to some of them, like uh, the FEC has Gurkhas and things like that. So, but I don't feel the need to, to do that, to go in any kind of deeper than that. So with, uh, now with the Commonwealth, I will say uh, there's not a lot that's new on this that you haven't already seen on the German one, because uh, I didn't come up with, uh, they, I, I struggled a little bit to come up with some original stuff for them. Uh, there are a couple things that I kind of came up with that I are, are um, they were percolating, so I went ahead and I just, you know what, let me just put it on paper. Um, there are things I like about it, but I'm not a hundred committed, I'm not a hundred percent committed to that particular idea yet. So I'm just putting some of these out there to see what kind of, uh, uh, you know, feedback I get. So, so with the Commonwealth air reconnaissance, and this is, uh, basically just like the, uh, the German one, you can fly your, uh, medium actually, and I also put, I added heavy bombers. Uh, some of these, some of these aren't one hundred percent updated because I use the German sheet as my core sheet for some of these. Um, so when I update it there, I will cut and paste. But sometimes I forget to do that. Um, but anyway, so during the attack phase, medium and heavy bombers may move into opponent land zone, which has an IPP value and roll an attack. If successful, gain one intelligence nation up to a maximum of land zones IPP. Um, and this option may be used when not at war with uh, the target major power. Amphibious armor, also just like Germany, you can designate one uh, light armor as amphibious during an amphibious assault. Uh, now here's one that is Britain specific. Prototype radar. I'm not sold on this, and I I, I don't love it, but I don't I, I kind of like the idea because uh, again, I almost went on to. Uh, explain some history beyond it, beyond it, but behind it. But uh, so, which I said I wouldn't do. So prototype radar, gain the following bonuses at each level of the radar technology. Level one, each airbase may scramble four units. Level two, each airbase may scramble four units and plus one to convoy modifier rolls. Level three, air, each airbase may scramble five units. And that should basically say that there as well. So it's also plus one to con convoy modifier rolls. Um, not sold on that. Um, I, I, I like the concept of kind of playing around with the uh, tech tree a little, uh, with some of these nations, uh, and, and some of their, uh, research and, and what they had going on research wise, uh, leading up to the war and during the war. Um, but I don't know, give me, I would really like some feedback on that one. Um, so combined arms, uh, again, this is just the other one, uh, at least one air class, vehicle class, artillery, and infantry class unit. You may make one additional attack or defense roll at three. Uh, counter intel operations. At the start of a Commonwealth player's turn, all opponents who currently have Commonwealth intel points must roll one die for each point. On a roll of one through three, that intel point is discarded. Let me go ahead and read intel point rules as they are written right now. Intel points are kept in a pool for each enemy major power and are kept separate for each nation that gains them. Meaning, uh, Italy will have a pool for uh, the United States, for the Commonwealth, uh, for Russia, uh, and for France. And then Germany will have a pool for each. And I basically, I just envision taking a roundel with some great chips under it is probably the easiest way to do that. Um, but that's what that first sentence means. One intel point you have for a specific nation may be spent when performing a mission targeting or defending from that specific nation to increase the attack or defense of the unit on that mission by two. The attacker defender must choose to spend the point prior to making any rolls. An intel point may also be spent to give a unit in combat against a specific nation plus one attack or defense for the duration of that battle. One intel point may be spent like this per battle and must be used prior to the start of the battle. For purposes of organizing intel points, Great Britain, Far East Command, and ANZAC are kept together as the Commonwealth. So that's how I envision intel points working. Uh, you basically primarily use... Uh, the biggest bonus for them is, is when you're conducting missions against that nation. Um, but 
I didn't want them to be specifically... I, I don't like things being pigeonholed and then sitting there and not having other options to use with them, even if those other options aren't quite as useful. And that's why I gave it that other ability to, to at least give a combat bonus to a unit, because you would look at that as, as actionable intel you can use in the field. <clears throat> so that's how intel points work right now as written. So I wanted to kind of just dive into that real quick as I... Uh, <clears throat> When I, uh, because I, re I had read Counter Intel Operations, which right now is just a Commonwealth-specific one. Um, exploitation movement, gliders, infantry support weapons, mechanized combat are all just like Germany. Uh, moving during... Uh, uh, excuse me. Units moving after combat into a, a zone... Uh, that was captured if they have the movement plus to an attack when performing airborne assaults with the gliders uh, uh, target selection one vehicle class units with infantry support weapons mechanized combat if you have twice as many vehicle class units as your opponent gain one additional attack or defense roll which hits on a one through three now here are two that well let me come back to these two then the last two is uh, versatile anti-aircraft artillery which most nations are going to have this available to them because it was kind of a well-known tactic and this is where you can use your anti-aircraft artillery as anti-armor artillery as well um, if you choose and then this one refugee volunteers the first time an axis player takes possession of a neutral land zone or any land zone part of the french home country gain one gain one volunteer point so Volunteer points. During the production phase, you may spend one volunteer token to reduce the cost of a unit by one. Only one volunteer token may be spent per unit. <clears throat> and of course, Britain did have a lot of expatriates from the conquered uh, uh, Axis nations, uh, you know, swarm or were already living in Britain, and they, they volunteered um, to, to fight. So that's, uh, that's part of what Refugees Volunteer is about. Now, I, they had a house rule for POW camps along with the marker on their website, and I like the idea behind POW camp. What I don't like is the additional step of rolling after com every combat to see if a POW camp gets placed in that particular territory. Um, I just feel that that is, I'm trying to keep extra die roll steps as limited as possible. Um... Sometimes I think it's appropriate for various things, and, and one good example of that is the uh, uh, counter-intel op counter operations. That is an extra s role that certain players will have to make. Uh, I felt that was... There are non-rolling ways I could probably come up with that, or, or rewrite that rule, but I didn't feel that that was too heinous. But because combat phase itself is already very already has all, most of the combat, most roles you're going to do throughout the game, I kind of wanted to, to not have a role with this one, for starters. Also, um, I like that the way I wrote this rule is a way for a uh, enemy nation to grief kind of the Axis player and burden them in a way um, that really hadn't existed prior. So this is how I wrote it, and I'm not 100% that I, 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 like the, I like the concept, but I'm not sure I'm, I'm married to the execution. I'm not sure I'm happy with the execution, uh, though there are elements to it I like. So once at war with a major power, at the end of your turn, you may place one POW camp marker in any land zone currently occupied by an opponent. Okay, that's the doctrine. Now, when I come over here, POW camps, the rules for POW camps are as follows. When a land zone containing a POW camp marker is liberated, the liberating nation gains, gains one IPP regardless of which nation placed the marker. Any major power which has a POW camp marker in a land zone it controls during its turn may move that marker using one rail capacity during the normal rail movement rules. So, the idea with this, if, if it isn't obvious already, is... Uh, in this case, the British player goes, all right, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to place a POW camp here in uh, uh, Normandy, uh, in France. And uh, uh, then on the German player turn, it rolls around to his turn, and let's say, assume it hasn't been liberated. One, it gives the British allies a chance to maybe go liberate it. Uh, but if it doesn't, then the, al then the uh, 
German player in this case has to go, well, do I want to burn the rail and move that inland so he can't easily take it? Or do I just kind of suck it up and leave it there? Um, and, and give him, you know, give him a reason to go particularly take that territory, or do I leave it and just maybe put an extra couple units there to defend? Um, now it's not a huge bonus, but if these start stacking up, uh, and other nations possibly take this, uh, something similar to this, or there's other ways that POW camps can kind of populate the board, then suddenly this is something that can burden the Axis, and it's something that they have to worry about. Um, so I like that concept. I'm just not 100% sure on the execution of it yet, whether I should incorporate into core rules somehow, or whether, um, uh, as just part of the course, or whether it should remain a, um, uh, a doctrine for certain nations. Um, I, I'm kind of going back and forth on that. So some feedback on that would be great. And then this is one I came up with when I was thinking of some German ones, I fleshed it out and I went ahead and added it to the British because it makes sense on theirs as well. Uh, again, I'm not 100%... I, I like the idea. I'm not 100% on the execution. Um, so let me just read it. Once you reach level two of the following technologies, which will be listed here, you may build a single prototype model unit. Oh, one thing I did not add here is there is a prototype marker, which I need to add the... Um, the number there, because this is a, uh, that this is part of what helped me with this idea was seeing that prototype marker on HBG's website. <clears throat> Once you reach level two of the following technologies, you may build a single prototype model unit. A prototype model functions just as a regular type of that unit. And so long as it is in play, sorry, some, I get really annoyed when I find <laughs> stuff like that in there. As long as it is in play, you receive a plus one to all your technology rolls for its respective research. If a prototype unit is ever destroyed, it may be rebuilt. Once you have completed research of a prototype, then the prototype marker is removed from that unit. No cost discounts may ever be applied to the cost of a prototype unit, and its build time may never be reduced. And then the, the cost for the prototypes, which is steep, is as follows. So advanced artillery would be 6 slash 7. So that's uh, regular advanced, that's self-propelled advanced. Uh, heavy armor would be 12 IPP. Jet fighter, 18. Heavy strategic bomber, 19. Advanced sub, 11. Strategic rocket, 6. Heavy battleship, 10, 10, 10. Heavy carrier, 9, 9, 9. And attack transport, 13. So, um... The benefits are twofold in that you get this advanced unit uh, much earlier than you would otherwise, uh, and you get a bonus to your technology roll so long as it's in play. Uh, the downside is you are paying a lot for it. Um, a lot, a lot. Um, the other uh, uh, downside is uh, it could be very well targeted by the opponent for destruction just because it's all that much juicier of a target. And even if you build it and then it becomes a regular model once you finish that research, you still paid out the 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 nose for just to have one on the board already. So again, I I kind of like this idea. Uh, I, I came up with some other why other ideas about how to to kind of execute something like this. Um, but this is a uh, uh, this is kind of what I settled on for playtest purposes. Um, so again, give me some feedback on what you think about that. Um, and uh, and yeah, we'll go from there. So as it stands, this is Britain. Um, I did struggle a little bit to come up with some original stuff for Britain. And I will mention that with some of these nations, I did struggle a little bit. And oh God, wait till I get to Italy. Wow, uh, they were rough. Um, but, uh, you know, Germany was easy. They had all, you know, they were, they were the ones who basically innovated so much of that war to begin with. Uh, they did a lot of unique things and, uh, they, you know, invented so much, basically what would become modern technology and modern tactics that they were easy. Um, some of the other nations were a little harder because they were, uh, behind the times when the war started, they took a little bit of effort to get caught up. Uh, you know, uh, Britain did not, they were not innovate. I mean, they certainly made some great tech advantage, advantage, advances during the war, and they had great boffins, but uh, their, their actual battlefield tactics did not uh, progress 
uh, terribly fast. Uh, America was a little iffy, um, you know, so some of them were harder than others. Uh, but if you see any or if you know the history of uh, some of these nations and how they fought, um, and it isn't something that uh, isn't, uh, and you think it should be added to the list of that nation, please, please, please put it, you know, either email me, like I said last video, uh, my email is in the about section, or feel free to, uh, uh, you know, you can email me if you don't want to post it, but, you know, any feedback would be appreciated, particularly on the ones I, I mentioned here that I think were a little iffy. Uh, and, uh, yeah, with that said, uh, uh, this is Wintermute signing off, and uh, subscribe.